Okay, so this is going to be an exploration of creating useful interfaces for you or users of your library in Rust for doing things with strings. Um, this is going to kind of assume that you're already familiar with Rust. Maybe you've already read the book, right? The Rust Lang book on, on the website there. Um, or you've written more than a couple of Hello World programs. You kind of get the ins and outs of the language, but you're starting to actually make productive things with it. So if you're a beginner or a total novice, I advise you go check those things out. I'm going to reference some things about memory and types in here that might be unfamiliar if you haven't seen that already. So assuming that you already have a little bit of a background in the language, and now you're trying to build useful things with it. One of the things that you have undoubtedly encountered is there are two different string types, primarily. Um, the first one is this string slice, uh, the most primitive string type right here, are the docs on it. But essentially, you usually see it as this little borrowed ampersand str. It's basically a pointer and a length in memory somewhere. It's almost like a C string. Um, that's what a string slice is. It is immutable. Uh, right, it's an immutable borrow. So all the operations that you can do on it over here, they don't change how it works. Um, they don't change the underlying data inside of that slice in memory. Uh, to do that, you're going to have to convert it to another type. Typically, the string, the capital S string, spelled out like the word string. Um, this is the type that has ownership over the contents. Uh, so it's not a borrow. Um, you can actually run methods like clear on this, right? Or insert or drain. You can change what that looks like in memory because it's basically a growable vector of kind. Uh, excuse me. It's kind of like a growable vector of bytes, basically. And you can do whatever you want with those bytes inside of it. Uh, what that means, though, is typically when you're creating it, you're allocating storage, right? Uh, I think it's, it's heap storage. Uh, whereas with the string slice, you're kind of looking at compile time data on the stack. Uh, I could be wrong about that. Don't quote me. It's been a while since I actually explored how these things are, are constructed. You can read the documentation to learn more. But it's an important distinction because what it essentially means is if you're writing a function and you want to accept a string, and return a string. And maybe you're going to do or not do something with that string. If you return a string type, right? So a capital S string all the time, you're going to allocate all the time, right? You're going to create that new type. You're going to allocate memory for it. And that incurs a cost, uh, just like everything does when you're working in memory. Uh, if you were to try to return a string slice all the time, well, first of all, it's going to be kind of difficult because it's almost it's determined at compile time and you can't really know the type at compile time. So now you're going to deal with weird lifetimes and maybe you have to have the static lifetime. It starts to get really messy and complicated. But if you're going to return a string, which is just a reference to another string, and it's easy enough for you to return an immutable borrow, to the original string slice that was passed into your function, for example, that's a good reason to return a string slice because now you're not allocating anything. You're just changing up pointers and handing back a pointer to something else somewhere in memory. Uh, that's going to be a nice interface for people who use your function who don't want things mutated. Uh, but then again, if people want things mutated, you're going to kind of have to stick to the string type. And so you start to go this back and forth, like, OK, do I accept string slices? Do I ex accept full growable strings? Do I return growable strings? What do I do? Uh, so the point of this video is for me to walk you through what I've kind of settled on as a way to write one single function with parameter and return types that make it easy to accept any of the above and only clone or allocate memory when you have to. So let's take a look at this test program here. Uh, I have this library. It's basically a bunch of unit tests. And I have one function up here, reverse. This is going to reverse a string. That's the operation that I want to do here. But I'm going to get smart, <laughs> if you will. I'm not going to reverse that string if it's a palindrome. If it is a string that looks the same forwards and backwards, I'm not going to allocate new memory and copy all the bytes back in. I'm just going to return the same thing that was given to me. So that presents a couple of interesting issues, right? First of all, 
I'm going to return something with allocation where I've reversed all the bytes of my input, or I'm going to return something that's not allocated and is a reference to the thing that was presented to me. Uh, the second thing is I want this reverse function to accept any kind of string type my user's working with. I don't want them to have a slice and to have to allocate memory by creating a growable string type, right? One of these, um, just to use my function. So my parameter is not going to be a capital S string. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute here. Let's take a look at some of these tests first so you can kind of see what I'm trying to do. And this is me writing tests before I write the code so that I can build an interface for my code and I know what it's going to look like for people using it. So these first two tests are really just a testing of logic and functionality, right? I've got a palindrome function. It takes this madam I madam, passes it to reverse, and it should come out looking the same. So I'm asserting that the input here is going to look like the output here. Makes sense. Uh, and then I have this not palindrome function here. I have this piece of gobbledygook. And I want to see it look like this gobbledygook that's opposite, right? It's all reversed bytes or reversed characters when it comes back out the other side. So these are testing that regardless of whether the string is a palindrome, it looks reversed when it comes out on the other side. Then I have these functions down here. And these are really all about the usability of my function. Uh, so I have this any param function here. And what this is doing is saying, OK, for my single reverse function, can I accept a static string slice, which is just a literal? Uh, can I accept a growable string as a borrow? Can I accept some of these clone on write types? Anything that can be dereft de as a string slice, basically, I want reverse to work with it. That's really nice for my users because what that means is they can use it in this many different ways. If they happen to have a clone on write type with a string inside of it, they can pass it. They just have to put the little borrow in front. If they have a growable string, they can pass it with a borrow. If they have a literal or a string slice from somewhere else, they can pass that. They don't have to change a whole lot. And then down here, I have tests on the result type, so the output of my function. Here I've got some immutable methods, right, being run on the result or, or on the return type, excuse me. So I've got this dot len right, just getting the length of whatever comes out of the reverse function. Uh, that's just saying that I want to be able to run dot len like I would on a typical string slice, right? This is a, uh, a method that I believe is on, yep, here we go. It's on the string slice, just returns a u size for how many characters are inside of the uh, string. I want to be able to run that on whatever comes out of this without having to do any conversion. That's important, right? I didn't have to cast this or convert it to something else. And then this mutable deref, uh, I'm just doing some, I'm doing some mutable operations. So here I'm saying, no, I want to take ownership on whatever comes out of this. And I want to do something mutable in it. I want to pop a character off the end. Uh, that's an operation that requires whatever comes out of this to be something that I can take ownership of. Typically, that's a growable string type, right? Uh, but we're going to save on allocation if possible. And we're actually going to provide, in the event of a palindrome, like this taco cat here, we're going to provide a return type, which is not immediately copied. It's not immediately cloned and allocated. It only is if the person who's using it wants to do that. Uh, and we're going we're gonna to talk about how that works. And I glossed over some details here. Hopefully, it'll all make sense as we start implementing it. So first things first, functionality. Let's take a look at accepting an input string slice and then reversing it. So as I said before, I want to be able to accept practically anything. And I don't want the person calling this function to know that I'm going to mutate their data. I don't like doing that. Uh, it kind of looks like a side effect. Unless you have a function whose purpose is to mutate the data that you provide, I like to not do that if possible. So I'm going to take a variable called test as a parameter, and it's just going to be a plain old string slice. So they know when they give that to my function as a user, they're not going to have to worry about me changing the contents of it. If I do anything, I'm going to be cloning inside my function. So they can reuse that string later if they want to, and nothing changed. Now let's look at actually reversing characters. 
There's a bunch of different ways you can probably do this. Not the whole point of this video, so I'm just going to use some iterator functions on the string slice. If I do test.chars, I get an iterator of all the characters in a string slice. Actually, you can see the help popping up here for what that looks like, right? Returns an iterator of a character as a string slice. And then for any iterator, basically, I can convert it to a reverse iterator by passing dot rev like that. That's basically a reverse iterator of characters. If I want to compare that to another iterator, I can use dot eq. It's starting to get kind of functional programming language on here, but bear with me. Uh, and now I want to compare that to all the bytes in the original order to see whether or not these things are reversed. So for that, I can do test.chars. That's the easiest way I know of to basically uh, not, not just reverse the string, but also compare two strings to see if they're palindromes or to make check a string to see if it's a palindrome, right? Uh, seeing if the bytes in an iterator reversed are equal to the bytes not reversed. Um, and because I want my reverse method here to only actually do something in memory with that string and produce a new string with scrambled letters, if the things are not palindromes, I'm going to turn this into an if statement. Now I'm going to do something different for if the reverse is equal, which means it's a palindrome, and then I'll have an else, and I'll do something different if it's not a palindrome. And that's going to be how this works. I'll go ahead and put little to do's in here just to make the compiler a little bit happier. All right, save that. Now I'm over here in my uh, little bacon checker, right? My file directory watcher is just compiling things and checking things in the background. Six errors and two warnings. So I'm making progress, making my tests pass here. As you can see, I'm already accepting all of these as possible parameters just by specifying this and string up here. So when you're building functions, again, unless you need to change the data in the string being passed by your user uh, and you can't clone it, you know, if you have data constraints or memory constraints, I would go this route. So that gives you all of this functionality for your user. All they have to do is pass it with little borrow ampersands. Fine. OK. Now let's get to the return type, right? Uh, we actually got to get a string out of this somehow. Uh, and this is where we need to get clever with our memory constraint um, requirement, I'll say, right? If it's a palindrome, so if I enter this block, I want to return the same thing that they gave me. I don't want to create a new string and copy a bunch of characters over in the same order that was provided to me doesn't really save a whole lot of memory or time. I'm just going to give them the thing that they gave me. Easy does it. Uh, so if I don't do that, if I have something that's not a palindrome, like this guy down here, right? I'm going to have to allocate. I'm going to have to build a new string. I'm going to have to copy in the characters from my previous string. And I'm going to have to return that, basically. So how can we return something that can be both an immutable reference and a mutable reference, depending on how we construct it and what our user wants to do with it in the end? Because we could just return a string. But like we said before, uh, that's going to mean allocation. If our user doesn't need a string type, i.e. not a slice, uh, it's going to be unnecessary and wasteful. And the secret to this is something that I'm actually already using down here in the tests. And you probably already caught on. What is this cow borrowed and owned? And I know I glossed over it, but let's take a look at that. So here's the cow. <laughs> here's the clone on write smart pointer that the Rust standard library provides. This is really useful stuff. Basically, this encloses or encapsulates some data and provides both immutable access to that borrowed data. And then if mutation is required, it will lazily clone it for you. It clones on write. It clones your data only when somebody wants to dereference it to do something mutable on it. Now, it sounds like a lot, um, but we don't have to worry a whole lot about the implementation. Basically, what it means is you can create a clone on write pointer with some string type. Uh, you can create it with a slice, for example, if you want to. And it will only make a clone of that data when it gets returned 
if your user wants to go and run mutable operations on it. So instead of you allocating a string, you force your users to allocate a string, but it does it in a nicer fashion for them. They don't have to think about what kind they're going to use. Uh, and a lot of times it's going to be totally transparent. If they're just doing immutable things with it, they wouldn't even notice that they got provided a, cop a clone on write because it implements DREF. You can call all non-mutating methods directly on the data it encloses. So if you provide a cow to somebody who expects a string slice, they can run all of these functions that the string slice provides without even realizing that it's a clone on write. Uh, if they want to do something mutable with it, they have to do one tiny step. They would have had to do that anyway if they were going to get something immutable from you, but that's okay. So let's go ahead and use that. So I'm already importing it up here at the top. I've got my cow. Uh, and the basic interface of cow is all in the construction. So for our palindrome, we want to return the original string. We're going to create a cow. We're going to create a borrowed cow variant. It's kind of an enum. Uh, and the data we're going to provide is test. That's the thing that we're going to return. Uh, and we need to add a return type to our function, obviously. Otherwise, we're going to get compiler errors. This is going to be a cow around a string slice. And let's see. Ooh, we had a lot more compiler errors go away, right? All of our all of our memory management is looking good, which is what that means. Yay for no seg faults. Uh, obviously, I have a to do in here, and that's a runtime panic, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, and all my tests down here are compiling as well, which is really cool. So what I'm doing here is I'm saying, I'm going to create this cow type. I've got these two variants that I can create, borrowed and owned. Borrowed is borrowed data, owned is owned data. Not the most helpful docs, but essentially, you give it a variant containing the data that you have whether it's a borrow or not. So if I'm going to give somebody back a borrowed string slice, I'm going to use the borrowed variant. Then if I'm going to give them back owned data, I'm going to wrap it up in an own. It's just kind of how the cow works, basically. And you can see some examples of that down here, how it's constructed and how you would use it. Actually, I think they might be uh, up here. Yeah, here we go. So you can use cow from, oh, you know what? You might even be able to use cow from. Oh, hang on. I wasn't planning on this. This might do it automatically for you. Let's go back over here and see if I can just say from. Wow, look at that. That's wonderful. I don't even have to specify the variant by hand. I learned something new today. Okay, so now I'm just saying, okay, cow, I don't care. Figure out from this type, uh, infer, if you will, from this type, whether it's a borrowed or an owned type. And I don't even have to specify that. That's pretty cool. So now I'm creating this cow type from my test. Uh, and the test is, again, a parameter coming in from the user. So if it's a palindrome, you're getting it right back, whoever my user is. And I'm not going to do anything with it. Now let's handle the other variant or the other result of this. If it's not a palindrome, uh, we're going to create another cow. And this time we're going to have to provide a newly allocated string with the reversed bytes of the original starting string. And again, the best way for me to get the reverse characters of string is to use iterators. It's just what I like to do. So I'm going to provide that. I'm going to give it a dot collect. So I'm going to take an iterator and actually move that data into a uh, an owned type, uh, move them into a, uh, typically a vector. But in this case, I'm going to say, do it as a string. So give me a string from the reversed characters of test and put it in the cow and return it. Uh, and I saved it and we don't have any compiler errors. Fantastic. We know that we're <laughs> we don't have any memory leaks. Hopefully, uh, if the compiler is happy about it, that's a good sign. That means all of our borrowing is right. And that means that all of these operations down here are perfectly content as well. Uh, as I said before, Here's us doing something immutable on top of whatever comes out of reverse. Here's us doing something mutable with whatever comes out of reverse. And this into owned is basically just a wrapper saying, yeah, whatever came back from there, I know it's it's a uh, clone on write. Just go ahead and make it an owned type so that I can do something with it. 
I think that that's a requirement for Cal. And this is kind of one thing that I wish was a little different about this interface, but it's probably really hard to do at the compiler level. It implements DREF, so you can call all the non-mutating methods, right? Uh, but if mutation is desired, to mute will obtain a mutable reference to an owned value, cloning if necessary. Uh, I don't think that I'm able to convert on the fly to something mutable. Yeah, I think I have to go and actually call like to mute on it or to owned or into owned in order to actually get it into something that I can mutate. But that's okay. All that requires my user to do is if they want to mutate the output of my um, my function, they're going to have to take ownership of it themselves, and that's fine. Okay, let's go and see if this actually passes all of our tests. And it does, fantastic. So we got five tests, all of them passed. That means that things are working well. Let's go back here and look. Uh, this is it, actually. This is this is probably the way that I would do it if I was writing some production code um, to actually accept a string type of some kind and then return a string type of some kind. Uh, it's agnostic to what your user wants to do with it. Uh, if they get back a clone on write and they don't do anything to write to it, uh, they're just going to use the reference. It's going to save them a little memory. It's going to save them a little headache with parameters as well, because I'm accepting anything that can be, be referenced into a string slice. Uh, this is just kind of the method that I've settled on for writing functions that accept and return strings. Think about if it suits your use case. If you have to do something different, you might not want to do that. Uh, you might have reasons for not wanting to do that, but it gives you all of this functionality down here without having to worry about um, your users passing lifetimes or doing things with the result to, or you allocating memory if you don't want to. So there's a lot of perks to it. If you know a better way, I'm always learning. I'd love for you to go ahead and drop it in the comments. I might make another video out of it because as you can see here, I just learned a new thing today. There's always an opportunity for that. Anyway, thanks for watching. Hope this was helpful. Enjoy your rest. Enjoy the guarantees that the compiler gives you. Uh, and hopefully this removes or alleviates some of the headaches with working with string types. Thanks.